You are listening to A Powerhouse Perspective with Bob Andrade. And now, live from San Pedro, here's Pastor Bob. Good morning and welcome back to Powerhouse San Pedro. Did you know that bananas are actually berries and raspberries are not? Hmm. Did you know that the Beatles used to be called Johnny and the Moon Dogs? Yeah? Did you, you didn't know that? Why? Yeah. Well, let me tell you a little bit about that if you didn't know that, Kathy. In, ni- in 1959, the Beatles were called the Quarrymen. And briefly, they changed their name to Johnny and the Moon Dogs. They didn't seriously consider this name to be permanent, but nevertheless, they changed it. Later that year, they competed in Carol Levis's TV star search contest as Johnny and the Moon Dogs. Uh, by the beginning of 1960, though, they changed it back to Quarrymen. Then that year, they changed it again to the Beatles, B-E-A-T-A-L-S. Interesting. Then they went to the Silver Beatles, B-E-A-T-L-E-S. Then by August of 1960, they changed it to the Beatles as we know it. Wow. There you go. Yeah. And I know that Linda knew that. Exactly. So there you go. But did you also know that 98% of Japanese are cremated? Yeah, you knew that, huh? Yeah. No, well, not if you're going to buy a casket, huh? All right. I like the cremated. Did you know? That 3 billion fortune cookies are made each year in America. That's almost all fortune cookies are made in America. Did you know that? And 94% of American flags come from China each year. What is up with that, huh? All right. Can you handle one more? Did you know that Nintendo was founded in 1889? No. You did not know that, huh? Is that interesting, Art? You didn't know that? 1889. Well, you know, I looked into that, and the Nintendo company, Kathy, was founded on September 23rd, 1889 in Kyoto, Japan, by craftsman Fujaro Yamachi. And its headquarters is still in Kyoto, Japan. Now, the product they originally produced was Hanafuda playing cards. And with the increase in the popularity of playing cards, Yamachi hired assistants to mass produce cards to satisfy the demand, and then the company faced financial struggles due to the expensive manufacturing process and the high price and durability of the cards, which made it a low replacement rate because they were so well made. So as a solution, they produced cheaper and lower quality line of playing cards. And so as time went on, after surviving World War II, As time passed, Yamachi passed on his Yamachi Nintendo and Company to his grandson, who officially had it titled Nintendo Playing Card Company. And then in 1952, the company began a new line of plastic playing cards. I just barely got my first plastic playing cards not too long ago. But they had plastic playing cards, which which was good. And then in 1959, Nintendo signed a contract with Walt Disney. To incorporate Disney's animated characters into cards. And by the mid-60s, Disney's cards began to show signs of exhaustion. And Nintendo Playing Cards Company stock began to plummet. This caused the company to invest in other businesses such as Instant Rice, Love Hotels, (laughs) and Taxi Services. 
All in all, even though the taxi service was the most profitable, all in all, these ventures did not work. The company then tried producing tabletop games such as chess and mahjong. Is that how you say that? Mahjong. Then in the early 1970s, they released Japan's first electronic toy, a Nintendo Beam Gun. And this started an upswing in the business with over a million units sold. <laughs> then by 1973, the oil crisis hit hard which drove the cost of the plastic up and their business down. The next few years, they released a skeet shooting simulator with sensors that detected a beam from other players and other guns. Then in 1977, the company distributed its first video game console. It was called the Color TV Game. And they then went on to develop products and they were the first microprocessor for video game systems they produced. And then by 1985, Nintendo gained international recognition with the release of the Nintendo Entertainment System. And the rest is history. Game Boy, Legend of Zelda, Super Mario, Nintendo 64, Nintendo DS, GameCube, PlayStation, and Wii, and many more. Today, they are a trillion dollar company. Wow. Did you know that? No. Wow. Did you know that? No way did you know that. Okay, now, are you, with the, uh, the clock, are you ready for some clear, practical, everyday stuff that you can use? Yes. Kathy is. All right, Kathy. I'm going to give it to you. Not only will you be able to use what we're going to talk about today, but let me tell you, this can change your life. All those trivial things that I, we just talked about previously that you did not know are not life-changing. But what we're going to talk about now is life-changing. So sit back and get ready to take in today's download of truth. So if you remember, last week we listened, uh, actually we listed a number of things that we have learned here at Powerhouse things that have empowered us as believers. And so what I want to do is I want to take a moment to re-highlight one of those points of truth that we briefly mentioned last week. The truth that I'm talking about is the term ambassador. What was mentioned was the ambassador, as in the ambassadors for Christ. Now, this comes from the second letter to the Corinthian followers of Christ who gathered as a church um, and so I, it comes from uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, verse 17. So if you have your Bibles and you would like to turn there, we're going to begin to read um, the ambassadors of Christ is verse 20, but we're going to start back in verse 17, which is a very familiar passage. It was a passage we read last week, and it's a passage that many of us are familiar. We're going to get a head start and look at what comes before. Whenever you do Whenever you don't understand a passage, one of the things that you do is you read what comes before and read after. And we're going to do the before right now. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this, and I'm reading from the Passion Translation. Now, if anyone is enfolded into Christ, he has become an entirely new creation. All that is related to the old order has vanished. Behold, everything is fresh and new. And God has made all things new and reconciled us to himself and given us the ministry of reconciling others to God. In other words, it was through the anointed one that God was shepherding the world, not even keeping records of their transgressions. And he has entrusted to us the ministry of opening the door of reconciliation to God. Verse 20, we are ambassadors of the anointed one, Christ who carry the message of Christ to the world as though God were tenderly pleading with them directly through our lips. So we tenderly plead with you on Christ's behalf. Turn back to God and be reconciled to him. For God made the only one who did not know sin to become sin for us, so that we who did not know righteousness might become the righteousness of God through our union with him. So that brings us to that word ambassador. 
To define that word, ambassador is a diplomatic agent of the highest rank accredited to a foreign government or sovereign as the resident representative of his or her own government or sovereign or appointed for a special and often temporary diplomatic assignment. An authorized representative or messenger from another government. Interesting. So when we were transformed as new creations in the passage we just read, we became citizens of a new government. And this government was called the kingdom of heaven. Now, when Jesus died on the cross, he paid the price for our sins once and for all that granted us access to the kingdom of heaven through the admission paid for us through Jesus Christ while we still live on earth. Now, throughout the Gospels, Jesus spoke of this kingdom many times. He said things like this, the kingdom is near, the kingdom is at hand. Because through his death, burial, and resurrection, we were going to be granted access to the kingdom of heaven while still living in this world. And so his teachings became teachings of how to live in this world through the kingdom of heaven. His teachings refer to the kingdom, uh, re refer to kingdom living uh, and not world living. Um, a familiar passage that we know is Romans 12, 2, and it says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So for the sake of simplicity, let's call this way of living as kingdom living. Uh, so the currency of this world is, is money. The currency of the kingdom of heaven is faith. Now, if you look at the verses, you'll know why faith is mentioned so much, because it's the currency of the kingdom of heaven. An ambassador is a diplomatic agent of the highest rank accredited to a foreign government. Foreign meaning this world is not our ultimate home or destiny. Did you know that? Our ultimate and permanent home is with God for all eternity. And, and so knowing this, we need to know how to function while we're in this world, even though we have access to the kingdom of heaven. And that is what is laid out throughout scripture. We are to function with the understanding that comes through God's word. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. So when we understand that this world, we, or, or should I say, when we understand this world from God's pers perspective, we clearly see that this is not our world. We are foreign ambassadors representing the kingdom of heaven. So as we better understand this concept, we will see that this world doesn't owe you a thing. Have you realized that yet? <laughs> this world does not care about you. God cares about you. And if you look to this world for happiness, for purpose, for fulfillment, for fairness, for joy, for peace, you will be disappointed if you haven't already. As for me, I am learning to not expect anything lasting or purposeful from this world. I do not even expect this world to be fair towards me. Originally, before sin entered the narrative, this world was made for our enjoyment. And I can still see those things that God has God's fingerprints all over. So I enjoy what I see of God in this world. And I dismiss what I see is not of God. In the midst of all this turmoil that we are going through in, our, in this era, I can still see the glory of God all over this place. You can see it through sunset, right? Through, I don't know if you saw this week, but the clouds. We took a day yeah. trip for Nicole's birthday. We took a day trip down south and 
wow, the clouds were amazing. And then we see his glory in the view of his creation. We see his glory in the love that comes through people. We see his glory through laughter. We see his glory through smiles. And we see his glory through his goodness. And the things that do not resemble him, I dismiss. And through the turmoil of this world, I can still see God. And yet this world is still the closest I will ever get to experiencing hell. This is the closest I will ever get. And to those that are of this world and not of the kingdom of heaven, then this world is the closest they will ever get to experiencing heaven. This is as good as it gets. Kind of makes sense, though, you know, if you just try to live it up in this world, if this is it for them. Get all you can. For me, this time on earth is my hell. On my way to an eternity with God. I'm sure glad I'm passing through. And I say all that to say this. Don't expect too much from this world, but expect much from God while you're here. What we can enjoy is what God gives us while we're here. We can look and see the glory of God while we're here on this earth. But understand that this world doesn't owe you a thing. So I will use every piece that I can find while here to piece together and use kind of like a playground layout for me. God supplies the play equipment to play with. Because what this world has to offer is headache, heartache, sorrow, sadness, hopelessness, fear, worry, stress, instability, and shattered goodness. But what is found in the hands of God is happiness, fulfillment, purpose, satisfaction, hope, joy, rest, and peace. Amen. And that's why I find all of that in Christ. And I don't look for it in this world. Because what this world has to offer in that case is very temporal. It's very um, cheap. Mm -hmm. I like lasting things. And so um, that's why I look to God and the kingdom of heaven for the things that I want to enjoy in life. My relationship with Christ compared to this world, this world has nothing to offer me in the way of life overflowing. Mm -hmm. Scriptures even name the prince of this world as Satan. The prince of the power of the air. Ephesians 2, chapter 1, speaks of that. It says, and, this, and his fullness fills you, even though you were once like corpse, dead in your sins and offenses. It wasn't that long ago that you lived in the religion, customs, and values of this world, obeying the dark ruler of the earthly realm, who fills the atmosphere with his authority and works diligently in the hearts of those who are disobedient to the truth of God. The corruption that was in us from birth was expressed through the deeds and desires of your self-life. We lived by whatever natural cravings and thoughts our minds dictated, living as rebellious children, subject to God's wrath like everyone. But God still loved us with such great love. He is so rich in compassion and mercy. Even when we were dead and doomed in our many sins, he united us into the very life of Christ and saved us by his wonderful grace. He raised us up with Christ, the exalted one, and we ascended with him into the glorious perfection and authority of the heavenly realm, for we are now co-seated as one with Christ. Throughout the coming ages, we will be the visible display of the infinite, limitless richness, riches of his grace and goodness, which was showed upon us in Jesus Christ. For it was only through this wonderful grace that we believed in him. 
Nothing we did could ever earn this salvation for it was the gracious gift from God that brought us to Christ. So no one will ever be able to boast for salvation is never a reward for good works or human striving. We have become his poetry, a recreated people that will fulfill the destiny he has given each of us for we are joined to, to Jesus, the anointed one. Even before we were born, God planned in advance our destiny and the good works we would do to fulfill it. Isn't that good? Yeah. A new humanity. And that's why when you read verses like John 10.10 10, that says a thief has only one thing in mind. He wants to steal, slaughter, and destroy. But Jesus says, I have come to give you everything in abundance, more than you expect, life in its fullness until you overflow. Whew. This is why I think that when I read in the Gospels, Jesus speaking to the slaves and masters. And I always wonder when I begin to read those throughout growing up, I wondered, why didn't Jesus free the slaves? Why didn't he just, he could have, but he didn't. Instead, he spoke to the slaves and the masters. And I thought, why did he do that? Until later I realized he did that because he was showing the slaves and masters that true lasting happiness, joy, and peace doesn't come from your position on this earth. The true happiness and joy and peace can only be found in him right here. And when you find joy and happiness and contentment and fulfillment in him while you're in this world, you see no one in this world can enslave you. No one can put you in a position and imprison you. No one can take your joy. No matter where they place you in this world, no one can take your happiness. No one can take your fulfillment at all. That's why Jesus wasn't just freeing their environment, but he was teaching them how to be free from in here. So my true happiness and joy does not depend on my current surroundings and it's something i work on on a daily basis have i nailed this down to perfection no but i will why not this world cannot disappoint me because i do not look to it for my source of fulfillment so on any given day, regardless of where I find myself in this world, I can experience peace. No matter what is happening around me, I can experience joy. No matter what turmoil is in the news, I can experience satisfaction and happiness. I expect this world to offer me less than what I can find in God. So if you look to the things in this world for peace and peace of mind and happiness, you might want to reconsider because you're in for a long stretch of disappointments. A worried, fearful, unhappy, unsatisfied Christian is one who is looking to this world for their happiness, for their joy, for their fulfillment, and for their peace each and every day. If you consistently look to this world for lasting happiness, you might only find little spurts of goodness, but when the wind blows in a different direction, it's gone. But the wind of the Holy Spirit can blow instant and long-lasting peace, joy, and happiness. So if there's something in this world that is disappointing you right now, if there is something from this world that is wearing you down, I want to encourage you to exchange it for some rest. Scripture that we've read for the last few weeks is Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Then Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. And understand that that is an exchange. That is not just a good statement. That is an exchange that needs to be made. And when you exchange it, you don't take it back. You leave it there. And you leave it with him. And I don't know if you understand that concept. It took me a long time to really grab a hold of that. 
because I did learn to bring my cares to the altar and go through the whole assortment of things that I need to and give it to him. But I also noticed I picked it back up when I left the room. And it became a constant prayer. And I would come and bring it to the altar because the preacher would tell me, bring your woes to the altar. So I did. But he never mentioned to leave them. And if he did, I didn't catch it. And I, I think they were automatically attached to me because I don't even remember taking them back with me yeah, right until I got in the car or until I got home. And then I realized, oh, there it is. And then I couldn't wait to get back to church so I could yes. surrender it again. Yes. 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 Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. So what I want to do right now is I want to make a declaration over us. So I want you to position yourselves to receive and to stand with this truth, because I'm going to sing it over you. In just a moment, let me tell you a little bit about what I'm going to sing about this declaration. There was an old song written by a man named Horatio Stanford, Stafford. And this song was written after some traumatic events that happened in his life. The first two were the death of his four-year-old son, during the Great Chicago Fire in 1871. The Chicago Fire of 1871 then ruined him financially by 1873. He was a successful lawyer who had invested much money in property of Chicago. By this time, 1873, with all lost, he had planned to go to England where he was... Uh, where he was going to assist the great evangelist D.L. Moody in some upcoming evangelistic crusades. At the last minute, plans changed due to a business concerning zoning problems due to the great fire in Chicago. So he sent ahead his family. And while crossing the Atlantic Ocean, the ship that his family was on sank due to the collision with another sea vessel. All four of his daughters died, but his wife survived. His wife Anna then sent him the now famous telegram, saved alone. Shortly after that, as Stafford traveled to meet his grieving wife, he was inspired to write these words as the ship passed near where his daughters had died. Listen to these words. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to know, it is well, it is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part, but in whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh, my soul. For me, be it Christ, be it Christ hence to live. If Jordan above me shall roll, no pang shall be mine. For in death as in life, thou wilt whisper thy peace to my soul. But Lord, tis for thee, for thy coming we wait. The sky, not the grave, is our goal. O trump of the angel, O voice of the Lord, blessed hope, blessed rest of my soul. And Lord, haste the day when the faith shall be sight, the clouds be rolled back as a scroll, the trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend a song in the night. O my soul, it is well. It is well with my soul, with my soul. Mm -hmm. It is well, it is well with my soul. There have been many arrangements that have been written from this song. And I want to declare one of those arrangements, a current arrangement 
that goes with this. And as this song is being sung over you, I want you to hear the words and make it a declaration with faith of where you will stand in this world. Grander earth has quaked before, moved by the sound of his voice. Seas that are shaken and stirred can be calmed and broken for my regard. And through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. And through it all, through it all, it is well. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. And it is well with me. Far be it from me to not believe, even though my eyes can't see. And this mountain that's in front of me will be thrown into the midst of the sea. And through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. And through it all, through it all, it is well. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. And it is well, it is well. So let go my soul and trust in him. The waves and winds still know his name. So let go my soul and trust in him. The waves and winds still know his name. The waves and winds still know his name. And it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. And so let go my soul and trust in him. The waves and winds still know his name. So let go my soul and trust in him. The waves and winds still know his name. Through it all. Through it all, my eyes are on you. And through it all, through it all, it is well. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. And it is well with me. And I pray that. for us there's a saying that says if you don't stand for something you'll fall for everything and so where do you stand and I want to encourage you to stand with me that no matter what happens in this world and what we can experience in this world it is well with my soul because my strength and my hope don't even come from this world. And I'm learning each day how to receive happiness from a world that's not here, but yet it's here. And I have gladly taken on that role as an ambassador from a foreign land. And I trust that for you as well.
something I want to add to that. On Thursday nights, we uh, have a Bible class, and it's a, his it's a history class, really, a cultural and history class on, um, on the culture of uh, the first century, who are the readers of the book of Revelation. And currently, we are in the third chapter of Revelation, and it's, we're on the place where the seven letters were sent to the seven churches. What's interesting is that these letters were sent to these churches from Jesus himself through the pen of John, but through Jesus. And it's Jesus interacting with his church. This last week, we were on the book of, uh, excuse me, on the church, the gathering of Sardis. And we realized that we, instead of just looking at the, the group of believers from Sardis, we begin to look at the city that this gathering was in because we've realized, and the author of Revelation has, has pointed out many times that the characteristics of the believers that gather in a specific city reflect the state of that city. So whatever that city is known for, it becomes part of the character of those believers in that city. So just as Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamum uh, have, ha have great wealth and Thyatira have great wealth and great uh, buildings and structures of the temples of Zeus and, and the like uh, Pergamum has a library, had a library of 200,000 volumes in that library. 200,000 volumes, and that was before they printed. So every book had to be handwritten. And it wasn't 200,000 books, it was 200,000 volumes. And that just gives a glimpse of the wealth of that city. And so in Sardis, they were known for wealth and, 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 and well-protected and well-to-do. And so it, 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 it bled into the character of the followers of Christ in that city in Sardis. And in that city, the group of followers were, had a, excuse me, had a, a great um, reputation. They were known probably like that city to uh, probably to, um, to give to the poor and to take care of the needy. And they were, they were revered very highly amongst the city, just like the city was. As people looked at Sardis, they saw a city that was well-protected and, and well-structured and wealthy through trade. And so this church and this gathering of believers of Sardis were known for the same. And now Jesus addresses them and he says, I see your works. And though you look like you're alive, you're dead. And so you must change. See, the world saw them as they've got it all together. But yet Jesus sees and he says, that's not who you are. You've been doing that on the outside. And he says, this was on the inside that counts. So he said, change. And you see what Sardis was doing is they were presenting to God their sacrifice, their worship, and going, look how good it is. Come on. Look how well. I mean, we're so, we're, even the city respects us so well. I mean, look at that. Look how we're, and Jesus looks at the sacrifice, and he takes the position of the high priest. Because in Revelation, he is the high priest. He's in the position as the high priest. Now, in the Old Testament, what we know of the high priests is that they would be the ones that would uh, classify the sacrifices. So they would bring the sacrifices to the high priest, and the sacrifice had to be perfect. It had to be without a blemish. The animal that was going to be sacrificed had to be exactly, I mean, not any blemish at all. And if it did, then the high priest would reject it. So here Sardis was bringing their offering to Jesus Christ, the high priest. 
and he rejected it. And now as we go and come up to the 21st century, what might cause the high priest That was from heaven. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sorry, we'll jump right back in. Okay. If you want to take a moment to silence your phones, it would be good. Yes. <laughs> Look at our time right now in the 21st century. What might cause the high priest from rejecting our worship? Now, I want you to think for a moment because I'm going to ask for your responses. I want us to put some thought to that. What might cause the high priest to reject in any given church the worship today? Because in many churches, there's worship going on all over the place. There's no lack of worship. There's no lack of music. There's no lack at all. There's no lack. It's, it's in every church. You walk in any church and you will see worship before, during, after. But what might cause the high priest, Jesus Christ in this case, to reject worship? Art and then Terry, yeah, did you have your hand? What might you think? I, I suspect that maybe if if the worship is done with the wrong attitude, mm. then, then the high priest was rejected. But that's something that only God can do. Only God knows our hearts and minds and what's going through uh, with us. And what we're really thinking, uh, an ordinary person can look at us from the outside, you know, look on the, on, on the outer part of us, and things can look okay or things can look bad, but only God knows what's actually going on with us and he's looking for, for someone that's that's humble that's willing to do his will no matter what it takes yeah so the wrong attitude right. Right. and again that can only be seen from, from the high priest from the heavenly high priest not us terry we woefully need an inside job transformation because externally we've got the Externally, we praise and worship, but the inside has not really been transformed. Yeah. Yeah. We all need a serious, and I'm speaking for myself, yeah. a serious inside job. So what can be rejected is the unpure worship that can come yeah. from, from us. Good. Yeah. Un <clears throat> unconfessed sin and disobedience. Yeah. Yeah. Mixing the two together. Like oil and water, it doesn't mix. Yes. It doesn't mix. I mean, we don't have a time, but um, that's up to us. I mean, I can't see. To me, your worship is on point. <laughs> on point, man. And, I, and, and you probably might even see that with me, but uh, hopefully. But, um, <laughs> but you know what? That doesn't say anything because the, the thing that Jesus Christ said to the church of Sardis was, I see you. Right. I see you. Wow. And, and and that's what he says to us. Kathy? Jessie's got her hand up. She's got her hand up. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, add to what you said, which in, in an attitude form, a lot of people go to church for self-fulfillment and entitlement when they're worshiping and praise. It's more of a, oh, con like you want that mm. concert experience. Self-fulfillment, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's so true. I mean, I, as a worship leader, I've heard many from years of years and decades of being a worship leader. I've, I've heard many responses, like people that say, and I know they didn't mean it in a bad way, but I kind of picked it up where they go, oh, I really liked worship. And I thought, well, you know, that's not bad, but doesn't it matter what God liked? Yeah. Because the worship wasn't ours. And when the worship becomes our thing, whether we like it or not, yes. then it gets picky. Why do we do that song all the time? Why do we repeat that? Why do we do that? Why don't we do? So you see, you see how, because 
when, like you were saying, when it becomes a self-fulfillment, when, when we come to church so that we can feel good through worship, because we do, because there is a good, but when we come for that, then we will be disappointed. And, and, and then what if we come that Sunday and they don't worship? Oh my goodness. Then what are you going to do? You see, <clears throat> yeah, the motive. And, and I think that's the, the thread that's going through of, of what it was, because what it looks on the outside isn't always what it is in the inside. And so it's possible that as we worship this morning, that you reject your worship. I, I never even thought of that. I've been taught growing up in church that, I mean, just give anything to God. He's going to, because he's so loving. Yes. He's just going to go, oh, give me that. It's like, it's, it's kind of like, you know, your, your child, your, your, your one or two year old draws this picture of, you don't even know what it is, but it's the greatest picture in the world. And you put it up and, and you put it on the refrigerator and you, you marvel and you say, look how wonderful when you know that's not a wonderful picture because <laughs> who it comes from, it becomes wonderful. And so it causes us to think that no matter what I draw or what I do or if I worship, no matter what it is, that, he's gonna, that God is going to put it up in his refrigerator. But I want you to understand that according to Scripture, the high priest rejects worship if it's not without blemish. Yeah. Or if, it's not, if, if it needs to be without blemish. Yes. Yes. If it is with blemish. Yes. Wow, that's a whole different concept. Yes. I, I haven't heard that taught. That, that God may not accept your worship this morning. Imagine. Wow. <laughs> that, isn't that a new concept? Does somebody have their... Yeah, mine. Um, a couple thoughts. Help me with a scripture that says, uh, worship in spirit and in truth. Mm -hmm. And so we could probably study that a lot. But what is truth? I mean, we've been talking about it. Authenticity. Yep. You know, honesty. Openness, yeah, yeah. You know, not, not harboring sin, all those things. Spirit. Yeah. You know, not, not worrying about all the fleshly things. Yeah. All, all the material things. So, so that part really drives me to just mm -hmm. being proper and good and right. righteous before God. The, the part about the high priest being able to reject what came to my mind was the examples in Scripture that talks about the priesthood having too high of a standard and having a standard that was burdensome on people. So kind of the opposite of what you were just mm -hmm. saying. I see the value because God wants us to be perfect like he is. Well, we're really perfect. Like, what does that really mean? We're to, we're to strive for that, even though we know we're all sinners. Yeah. So I was actually thinking the, the worship to me is, yes, we should lean that way, but I can never be without blemish. So finding that goal of, of Lord, help me move to that, but I know that I'm not going to bring it without blemish. Does that? I understand what you're saying, but we can. Now, hold on. Listen, watch this. Watch this. Watch this. We can be not our goodness, but his goodness. Right. We can carry. We're not worthy. He's worthy. But we become worthy because of him in us. So how can we become unworthy is if we put him aside and do it our way. And we strive to do it perfect when really that word is also translated complete. That word. Now, perfect in the English language is a word that's unattainable. But in scripture, that word that is also translated complete, it is only attainable through Jesus Christ that is in us. So then we could become worthy. We could become without blame. We can become without blemish as we step in him. So we can worship him totally purely holy mm -hmm. and it has nothing to do with our effort it has nothing to do with that all it has to do with is sincerity and see so that's my experience on a sunday morning like this sometimes i walk through that door and i got bad stuff on my mind or we just had an argument or whatever's going on yep but in the process of my imperfect worship this body brings me in christ's spirit yeah yeah and that happens, and, and an atmosphere can change as well. 
And sometimes the atmosphere can't change because sometimes you will step into an atmosphere that is not empowered by God. So then that doesn't mean that you don't have a chance. <laughs> what that means is, is that you could, you can stand in any situation in this world and be in him and you could be perfect. Now it's really hard for us because it's really hard for us to say that we're holy. Well, I mean, he's holy, you know, not me, but really our identity is in him. So we are with him. If we say we're not holy, then what we're saying is, is what Jesus did on the cross wasn't enough. That he needed to do a little more in order to make us holy. But what he did was enough. So our understanding needs to change. And that's what we started out. We need to change our understanding. And that's why Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says to not lean on our own understanding. But when we understand like him and we step into that, we can be blameless. I know it sounds strange, but we can worship him with total wholeness as we sincerely say, Lord, I give you myself. Not, I give you myself, Lord. There are times when I have worshiped him like this. Yeah. Mm, yeah. And so, okay. Yeah. Anyway. So the, I know what, well, okay. Just, okay, I'm going to do, oh, where was it? Oh yeah. Oh, oh, I'm there. You see, and we, we, we flippantly do this. I would say it's better to just not worship. If you cannot with all your heart. Say, here I am, God. Yes. Whether you know the words or not, that during that time you say, Lord, I honor you or I surrender to you. Whether I know this song or not, I'm yours. And in that sincerity of time, you see, I've learned, um, I traveled with an evangelist that I was on stage every night of the average, every night of the year. We, we were in a different city and different church every week for a year. And so I, we couldn't afford to have moods. We couldn't afford to be on stage. And, and let me tell you, you, you can't be fake. People know fake. And I can't. I'm just really not good at doing fake. I'd rather not be on stage than to be fake. I just can't. I, and, and so I had to learn um, because we would have an argument backstage with some of the guys in the team. And we would have to go on stage at a church. And I couldn't do that. But I, I, there was a saying that was from uh, E.M. Bounds in, in, uh, in his book that I, I moved and I, I moved it to a different word. The saying was this, when it's the hardest to pray, pray the hardest. And then I adapted that because worship is prayer. When it's the hardest to worship, worship the hardest. So what I began to do is in all my imperfection and all my attitude, I began to put myself in a place where I say, I will, because I learned from David in Psalms. He went through all the emotions of hate and wanting God to slay his enemy and kill him and murder him. And why is it not fair? And then it goes right on to say, yet I will worship you. It became a decision. So I learned how to walk from backstage onto the front of the stage and say, I am so in a not play, not a right place, but I can't afford to go off the stage. I can't afford just to sit there and go and watch everybody else. The camera's on, the people are there. And so I had to say, I'm going to step right through that and I'm going to be like David and I choose because right now it's the hardest for me to worship. That means I'm going to worship the hardest. And as I began to do that, God met me right there. And my worship at those times became so powerful and pure. Why? Because I, it wasn't a game for me. It was like, in order for me to worship like I need to, I'm going to need to make a decision to worship him. And when I did with sincerity of like, God, I can't do this. And if it's in you that I can do this, then I'm stepping into you. I don't know how to step into you, but I will praise you and I will exalt you and I will give you all this mess. You want it? Take it and I'll give it to you. And in those moments, that began to give me a picture of what sincere worship was. And it was powerful. And did it change my attitude? Oh, you bet it did. I almost wanted to do that again and have a bad experience backstage. Yeah, Maria? I would say that the sacrifice of praise, uh, when you're 
Mm-hmm. You don't want to and you do it anyway, but dying the flesh, but yeah. putting yourself on the altar and, and getting into the worship. Yeah. And we, yeah, we have excuses. I say excuses. They're not reasons. Well, I'm not a singer. I don't have a voice. These are all excuses. They're not reasons. And, you know, and I, I've had people, it's like, I've had people that say, you know, pastor, you send me your messages. That's great. But I just can't look at them because, you know, it makes me want to be there. And if, since I'm not there, it, it's too hard. No, I'm not kidding. And I thought, mm, wow, that is an excuse. It's not a reason. You know how I know it's an excuse and it's not a reason? Because if somebody were to give that person $1 million in cash <laughs> to listen to yeah. the teaching of some crazy religion for one hour, yeah. I would do it. <laughs> you get any religion, I'll listen to whoever. For a million. Why not? It's not going to change my heart, but I'll do it. Yeah. See, we will do what we want to do. And we will make excuse for what we don't want to do. Amen. And the only ones that can tell the difference is the heavenly high priest, not me. And so I don't even position myself in a place where I could judge. Why? I put myself in a position where I can exalt or not. I'm in front of the camera. I'm in front of people. I gain nothing by putting on any kind of an act or being anybody that I'm not. It really works against me. So, Sylvia? Uh, yes, uh, well, Jesus, our uh, high priest, not necessarily, uh, we can't feel it as he's rejecting, but most likely if I hear the word in uh, John 4, 23 and 24, he explains us how he will accept because he says from here on worshiping the father will not be a matter of the right place but the right heart the right heart for god is a spirit and he longs to have sincere worshipers who worship and adore him in the realm of the spirit and the, in the truth mm -hmm. so if we just follow what he just say, it's it's like a dad explaining us what's the right way to do it. Right. And it's not a rejection, it's more like a instruction. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. You see, it's 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 not that God is a tyrant, he wants only the you know, and, and, and rejects it. it's not that. It's that he is holy. Yeah. And he is sincere. And so when we step into his presence, that's the only thing that gels. Mm -hmm. He rejects it because it can't be in that presence. Not because his heart will go and say no. Not because, no, it's not enough. Because that's our earthly example. That's not a heavenly. You have to know the heart of God. God is not a tyrant. That's not his heart at all. So whenever he rejects something, we have to look at the reason that lines up with his heart. And that is you need to bring worship. Your sacrifice needs to be all and sincere from you. So I want to encourage you in your worship today, tomorrow, this week, to give nothing but sincerity. Amen. Or don't give it to him at all. That's okay. But I want to encourage you, if you're ever in a position where you just don't feel genuine, you don't feel like you're in the right place, let me tell you this, you can be in the right place. Where there is a will, there is a way. And what you want, you can get in him. And so I encourage you to step through those excuses and experience probably the, the deepest place of intimacy when you step from an awful state right through into a heavenly state. And so I want to encourage you to do that. And, uh, and uh, we're going to do that here, but I'm going to say goodbye to you online and uh, to allow you to maybe put a CD on or a recording or just in your own words or whatever to just worship him right now if you can, if you're able to do that. 
Um, and if you're in a car, you might need to uh, just use your own words of worship. So good, good, God bless you. Have a great day, a great week, a great uh, month, and uh, enjoy worship unto the Lord. This concludes today's episode from Powerhouse San Pedro. Your feedback is always welcome, and any contributions to this ministry are appreciated. Now may your week be great, and your hope in what God can do have no limits.